Hello and welcome to the Ancient Craft YouTube channel. I'm James Dilley and this is of course another entry of nap time. In the previous episodes I've been looking at glass arrowheads, Paleolithic hand axes, which are all very very exciting, but for this episode I'm going to go right back to basics. It's important that before you jump ahead and run straight into making really cool, exciting things like arrowheads, which people always think about, that you work out how and why that process occurs, why the rock or material breaks in the way that it does. And before you go ahead and start to break any rock, I really encourage you to watch my health and safety video. It's not very long, it's only a couple of minutes, but it just means I don't have to go through it every time in every video in the future. And it's certainly worthwhile because I won't have to worry about telling you about goggles or gloves or things like that. So I'm gonna go right back to basics, as I said, but before I actually hit any rock, I'm gonna talk about selecting your rock, selecting your tools so that you have a really good idea of what to look out for when you're perhaps hunting for nappable material or you just happen to be in a field or by the beach and think, hmm, that looks like a really good rock that I could hit or that looks like a really good hammer stone. We'll cover all the basics, don't worry. Now, before I start bashing any stone, of course, I'm going to put on my health and safety gear so it's there ready, my glove and leather leg pad. Now I'm from Hertfordshire uh, originally, and in fact that's where we're filming nap time at the moment. And in Hertfordshire, particularly the north of Hertfordshire, we're on top of hundreds of metres of chalk. And within that chalk, you sometimes get pieces of stone like this. Now the skin of this stone might just look like the chalk around it, but inside it is this dark grey, blue or even jet black material that we know as flint. Now flint, because it's formed within chalk, is of course still sedimentary and people often think of it as volcanic or igneous, but it's not. It's actually made up of the secretions of tiny organisms that would have knocked along the sea floor in a lagoon-like environment anywhere between about 73 to 95 million years ago. Now the reason that I can nap it and predict how the flakes are going to come off is because it has a really high silica content and any material, whether it actually be a rock or a modern material like glass or porcelain that has a really high silica content can be flaked predictably and it's that that allowed people in the past and me today to work it. But what should I use to actually hit my rock? Now, I tend to use hammer stones or soft antler hammers or pieces of sandstone, the exact materials that people would have used in prehistory. Some people use metal hammers, either made of steel or copper, sometimes known as copper boppers. It's up to you. There is generally a bit of a divide. You can't really cross between the two very easily, I've found. I just try, like to stick to the ancient stuff. For my main hammer stones that take off the big, thick, heavy flakes, I like to use quartzite from just beach pebbles, really, because generally the sea has pre-tested your hammer stones. If there's any cracks or irregularities in the stone, they usually get broken up. So any of the pebbles that you find that fit nicely in your hand are probably good to go. I wouldn't recommend using flint hammer stones. They have been used in prehistory, but of course, if you're bashing flint with a piece of flint, there's an equal chance that the hammer stone in your hand might break and give you a nasty injury. Whereas quartzite is extremely hard and though it can flake, it's far less likely. It's not as brittle as flint. If you're not in the UK, and particularly the southeast of the UK, you might not have access to flint, but there's a whole variety of different other rocks that you can use. And as long as, as I said, it's got enough silica in it and it's homogeneous, and that means it's consistent all the way through, no layers, no coarse grain, no crystals of different sizes, and it should flake fairly easily. Things like obsidian work in exactly the same way, but you can go to much coarser grained materials that are igneous, for example. There are different types of basalt or tuff that you can use, but they're slightly coarser grain means that you might have to put in a bit more power, but in theory it should flake in exactly the same way. So once you've got your rock, you need to look at how you're actually going to get into it or where you're going to strike. There's a lot of things to consider before you can start bashing away. With my piece of flint that I have in front of me, I've already taken off a couple of flakes so that I can look at the quality of the stone 
inside of this outer skin, the cortex, before picking it up. Otherwise, it's a fair old weight to carry around to take back to your napping station and find that it's rubbish flint on the inside. It's just wasted energy, really. And you can see on this piece of flint, it's not jet black and glassy like the best flint. It's actually quite grey with a lot of fossil material in it. So it's average, but not perfect. But there's nothing wrong with that. It might just be a little tougher to work. It might not be ideal to make very, very thin tools, but it'll be perfectly adequate to use for just core and flake technology that I'll be doing today. In terms of looking where to strike your piece of flint or other knappable stone, it's almost always around the edge. Certainly for this kind of very basic, what's sometimes known as mode one core and flake technology. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the modes later, but in terms of what we're working on at the moment, it is just trying to take some flakes off and looking at where to get them off. And that's sometimes where people struggle. When you take a flake off, you are essentially undercutting some material and by undercutting some material you're putting in a fracture plane so as you strike the edge a line or plane will go through the rock and a flake will come off and I'll draw that shortly so hopefully it makes a little more sense. If I was to look at this piece of flint I've got a couple of good options really to go for. I've got all of this edge here and this edge here now, of course, you'll be asking straight away, well, why are you going for those edges? The reason why is that those edges that I have identified there have a nice, clean striking platform. And a striking platform is where you make your strikes with a hammer stone. And it's just a flat platform that receives the blow. So you can see there's a nice one there that's flat and one here that's fairly flat as well. And both these angles here are under 90 degrees. Now this one here is pretty close, but this one is far more acute, so it should be easier. Anything that's over 90 degrees, so if I tried to flake here and put in a strike over here, you can see that although it's flat here, it actually comes out and it's more of an obtuse angle. So the angle inside here is over 90 degrees. If I struck this hard enough, in theory it might flake, but it would be an awful lot of work and not give me a particularly nice angle to work off. And it might not flake at all, so it's best to approach it from a different angle or perhaps set one up that will make life an awful lot easier. In terms of how to hold your rock, both the hammerstone and the piece of flint, that's quite an important area, partly from a health and safety point of view, but also because people generally don't know how to hold it and protect their hands at the same time. The last thing you want to do is balance a piece of flint or stone or other workable material on the end of your leg near or on your kneecap, because if you hit it, all the shock will go through your kneecap and hurt an awful lot. The best place to have it on your leg is about the mid thigh area and I'll usually offset it either to the left or right ever so slightly. If I'm, and I am, right handed I will have the piece of stone or flint on my left leg. I find that if I am right handed and I work off my right leg I just find it twists my torso a bit so you have to constantly face down towards that side. I just find it a little more uncomfortable. You might find it uh, more comfortable and preferable. There is no set rule book for how to hold flint or for napping in general, but there are some certain fracture mechanics and principles that you have to stick to. I just find it easier to work my left leg. I've done it for years, so I find that more comfortable. I will hold the stone or flint in a way so that it's well supported. So one side butts up against my leg, which is sort of an anvil, and my hand holds the back, so it's well out of the way, but still offering good support. In terms of how to hold the hammer stone, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. I generally prefer to hold it in my fingers like so, so that my fingers are very much clear of the striking area. The last thing you want to do is hold it like this, because your fingers will receive all of the power instead of the flint. And that does hurt a bit like balancing it on your knee. So I would strongly recommend you think carefully about how you hold the stone. This is where a little bit of common sense comes into the napping process. Another way you can hold the stone is to wrap your hand round at the back. Some people prefer this. However, I find that if you're trying to detach very heavy flakes, 
as the hammer stone comes in, and of course, as the force is placed into the stone, it will try and rebound back through the hammer stone. The shock goes through your hand, and that can be quite uncomfortable too, which is why I favor holding it in your fingers so that the shock goes out through the back of the stone and you don't really feel it. I'll take off a couple of flakes just to show what I mean, and then I'll try and draw it out to make some sense of what's going on. So I'll, of course, put my goggles on. I've held the flint securely against my leg. Check how I'm holding the hammer stone. I'm going to strike for that little patch there. And there we go. I've got a double flake that's come off there, which does sometimes happen. But you can see that I've struck pretty much squarely on the point that I was aiming for. I'll aim for another flake here. Now you can see quite a lot of fossil material within this flint, which really gives the way the fact that it is sedimentary. So why do the flakes come off in this way? Well, you can see that I've struck from the top, not squarely on the edge, about a centimetre into the edge, that line of fracture has gone through the flint, undercut what is now this flint flake, and terminated here. And that's why sometimes in flint you can see these ripples going through it, because that is the shock that's trying to find its way through the flint. So I'll show you the how and why. To try and make some sense of it all, I'll draw out how flakes detach. Some people find it makes it a lot easier to understand. I'll pick up my trusty whiteboard and pen, and I'll draw out a piece of flint. So I've got my nice platform here, and there's obviously the rest of the flint there, and it comes up a bit like that. It's pretty much that edge that I just worked off. So if I was to strike over here, for example, if I struck hard enough, in theory, it would break off a really big curving flake. And that's a key component of the flint napping process is that the flakes will generally try and curve and curve inwards. They like to travel over a convex surface. Flint flakes or the energy that you put in that will be a flake will try and resist traveling through a concaved surface if it's a quite intensely concaved surface you might end up with a hinge fracture or a step fracture of some kind. So if I was to strike at this end which will be much easier and that's what I did earlier on the flint I was working on I'll put the strike here so it's not perfectly on the edge it's just inside the edge about a centimeter or so and the impact should be quite intense around here. Sometimes it bows out in the form of a bulb of percussion. It'll then curve round and terminate here. The curve can't go round continuously. If I want the flake to curve round further here, I have to change the angle of the platform so it dips down, so that the curve, instead of going down to here, can actually go down and across, and that's where you start to get into the thinning part of flint napping, which is not something I'm going to go into today. To take another flake off, I just need to move back with another flake and essentially keep the process. And if I want a thicker flake, I just have to hit it slightly further into the edge. As a rule of thumb, anywhere between half a centimetre to two centimetres into the edge is a good area to aim for. Any closer to the edge than about half a centimetre and certainly with a hammer stone, the likelihood is you're going to shatter the edge and uh, leave yourself with a really crinkled, messed up striking platform. But any deeper than two centimetres, and you're going to have to hit it really hard to detach a good sized flake, which you can do. And certainly if you're working on a large piece of flint to actually get some good, useful flakes off, it's quite a good option and process to take. But certainly with a, a small piece of flint like this, around a centimetre is a good margin to aim for. So hopefully this will give you some idea that uh, if I rub this off and actually show you why you don't want to strike at the edge, 
gloves are fairly multi-purpose, both for protecting your hand and as a whiteboard rubber. So if I was to strike at the edge and make contact over here, you're not actually undercutting any material because there's nothing out here. So you're just going to end up with an edge that's taking a huge amount of shock through that point there. Now, if I was to ask you, what's the strongest shape you can think of? Well, it'll probably be that shape. No, it won't. It'll be something like that, which is, of course, what we know as a triangle. A perhaps less common question is, what's the strongest part of a triangle? And at that point, you might think, hmm. And for most of you, you'll say, well, probably the points. Because, of course, if you think of a bridge or any kind of basic engineering structure, it's likely that triangles will be involved in the structure somewhere, and it's those points that bear a huge amount of stress often. The weak parts of the triangle are the flat faces. If you were to break a triangle, this is where you want to aim for. So essentially by hitting that point there, you're hitting the point of, you guessed it, a triangle. The weak parts, in theory, are here, here, or somewhere along here. Now you can't easily come through here because the angle isn't under 90 degrees and you can't come from this angle because it's inside the flint. So your only option is to come from the top here, anywhere along there. Hopefully that makes some sense. And if you find that you're crushing the areas that you're trying to work on, it's possible that instead of making contact inside the edge at about half a centimeter to a centimeter you're actually making contact with the edge itself and it's just continually crushing it if you keep that action and keep crushing it and can't really work out what's going on the likelihood is you'll start to make the job of undercutting it and removing it much much harder sometimes it's better to stop and think hmm, what am i doing here why is it not working and that's often what i will do it, if I take a flake off, I'll almost always have a look, even if it's successful. And certainly if it doesn't work, and doesn't work a couple of times, I'll have a, a good look to see what's going wrong, because there might be a fault or a fossil that I haven't spotted, or I'm just doing something wrong, which is just as likely. Certainly, if you're experienced, you can still make errors. So I might come back to the whiteboard later, but for now, I'll actually detach some flint. So I'll bring the piece of flint back in, and take a couple more flakes off and explain a little bit about what I was explaining using the whiteboard earlier. Hopefully it'll all start to make sense together. I'm going to aim for this area here about a centimetre into the edge. I'm going to tilt the flint slightly and you're still aiming to make contact directly on top of the edge and a good action is to have it perpendicular so it's coming in directly on top of that flat angle there but I'm actually going to tilt it slightly just so it's easier for the angle of my arm and you can see that it's rotating at the elbow. You might have a little bit of wrist action. It's more important with a soft hammer to have a, a much looser wrist, but it's certainly important to make it easier for yourself. I find that when I teach people flint napping as part of workshops, sometimes instead of moving the flint, they'll move the hammer stones. They'll start working around here, and then they'll start trying working over here, and it just becomes a bit of a pain, really. It's much easier to move the flint round. Really, your hammering arm and hand should be making this motion, roughly, and shouldn't be over here or over here, because you'll reduce accuracy, because you should be used to this action, really. So I'll tilt it, look at the point I'm aiming for, line myself up, Bang. Very little power involved. I'm almost using the weight of the hammer stone, just directing it really. Hopefully that will demonstrate you don't need to be really strong to be a flint napper. You can see I'm not the strongest person in the world. As long as you have fairly decent hand-eye coordination, and that doesn't necessarily have to be there at the start, you will develop it as you progress more through flint napping. But as long as you can hit a nail into a piece of wood, you should have enough strength. So I've got a good flake there that would be decent as a scraper. So I'll put that to the side for now. We'll come back to that later. For my next flake, I'm going to aim over here, and tilt it over towards my leg again, just clear any loose bits off, hold the hammer stone, straight down shot. And 
another good size flake, very similar to the one beforehand. Now, this film, like the last few, have been filmed during the COVID-19 lockdown. This is the noisiest background that we've ever had. We've had two chainsaws going off in the background, and it sounds like we have a, a shopping supermarket car park behind us. Everything is going on, so I do apologise for that. It just seems that everyone's out of lockdown now, and we're back to normal. Of course, we're not. That's what it sounds like. So I'll see if I can take off a couple more flakes. Again, I'm going to tilt down, look at my spot, have another go, another good sized flake. And some of these flakes are, are useful as they are. This edge here where the cortex is isn't particularly useful, but all of this edge here is absolutely razor sharp and be really useful for scraping or working on wood straight away. There's very little I need to do to it. And in fact, for most prehistoric tools, before they were retouched into scrapers or piercers or knives, the likelihood is that they were used for a period of time before they were then retouched. But we just can't see it anymore because we've got a retouch tool. If I want to take off thinner flakes, I simply have to aim closer to the edge. And if you've got access to slightly softer hammer stones, I've got a piece of limestone here. This is perhaps where you've got a good chance to get those thinner flakes because with that extra softness, they will retain a little bit of that shock and absorb it instead of the flint. So I'm going to tilt it down. You might have heard a slightly crisper crack Although that flake is actually waste flake or debitage that I won't need, this flake is a lot better and much thinner and sharper all the way round. And this could be used as a knife straight away or retouched into a piercer with that point there or perhaps a saw. So I'll come back to that as well. I'm starting to run out of space here on that platform there that I took off some time ago, but you can keep going. I think to continue here uh, will be a bit of a challenge. I might take one more off. There we go, but very thin flake. Now I'll come back to this side. Sometimes I do the actual napping holding the flint in my hand as well. It, it's really just down to your preference, to be honest. Now I've got a bit of a concave dished area here. The problem with those concaved areas to try and squeeze a hammer stone in so it makes contact with the area you want it to can be quite tricky because it's quite likely to hit the edge of that dished area. Sometimes it's worth using a rough stone, perhaps a piece of sandstone like an abrader, turn it over and just remove the extreme edges of that concavity so it's an awful lot flatter now so when I come back to it with the hammer stone I've just got better access see these very thin blade like flakes coming off I've got a really nice isolated platform here. This point that I'm aiming for here is all by itself and hence why it's an isolated platform. I'm going to abrade it quite aggressively and actually take some little tiny flakes off so that when I strike it now hopefully I'll have a nice straight flake that comes off it. So there we have a pretty useful blade. What I've used there is the ridge that runs down the flint here. And I'm not sure if you can see it as clearly as I can because it blends in with the colour quite a lot. But you can 
perhaps see these lines that run down. These are previous flake scars, and that's exactly what runs down the back of this blade here. And it's those that I'm using to direct the shock that I put into the flint. So if I go for this one, it'll probably travel over here. It would have had the flake not flown away. Braid again. Got a couple of ridges there. In the classic way that flint does, of course, each flake is breaking off. Now that I'm trying to say where the flint should be breaking, have another go. That's a bit better, still shattered a little bit, but you can hopefully see that apart from this scar here, the ridges have traveled down through the flint. As you get into flint napping, you may find that flint is one of the most awful materials to work with in the world. In theory, it is predictable, but my goodness, can it have a life of its own sometimes. I'm at the point now where I could actually turn it over and start working from here. This angle here is well under 90 degrees, and if I tilt it up so this flat platform is facing me here, I could get quite a large flake off here. So sometimes it's a case of just stopping and having a good look over the whole of your piece of flint or other stone. That's a good flake. Shame it broke, but I've now got all of this angle here. In fact, I could come back this way as well. Good size flake there. And now I've got all of this angle here to work with. Lots of shattering flakes, of course. I'll braid it a bit to strengthen up the edge. Now, the question may have come up in your head, well, why are you abrading it now? It's not concave. I'll draw it very shortly. So again, hopefully it'll make more sense. Some of these thin flakes that come off will be good arrowhead blanks. Another nice blade. got a, quite a nice platform here. I might be able to remove a lot of material here. Of course it's broken into three bits. Slightly oddly shaped flake, but it has cleaned off this entire area here. So now I've taken off a few flakes that I can use for a variety of tools. I'll put the core down and actually show you why you want to abrade that edge. So to show why you, it's worth abrading an edge, I'll go back to the whiteboard, grab that pen that's managed to escape me, use the glove again as my handy rubber. So if you can imagine a much thinner edge in this case, so I've got my flat top there, comes underneath here. If I was to strike here on the edge, about half a centimeter in, this point here, that I'm just coloring in, it, as well as being a very thin bit of flint, it's actually very weak and brittle, and it's quite possible the edge might just shatter. So instead, if I abrade from the opposite way, so I've got a zigzag arrow to show abrasion, with a very awful arrowhead on it. I'm actually going to abrade it back. Abrade that off, my fingertip. So it's now within a much thicker area. And if you can imagine you turn a, a metal knife on the side, you can see that angle that starts very thin and then goes back and gets thicker as you go back into the knife blade. And that's where it gets stronger. 
So if you take off that very thin edge back there that doesn't have much strength to it by braiding it, you move it back into an area that, much, that is much thicker and stronger. It also slightly tilts the angle as well. You remember what I was talking about earlier that you'll get flakes that travel a little bit further. So it has a two pronged approach really. So I'll stick the whiteboard to the side for now and go back to taking a, perhaps a couple more flakes off then some flake tools. So I'll take off a couple more flakes and actually abrade the edge just to show you perhaps the amount of abrasion that's required. So I've got this edge here I'm going to use the edge of this abrader. Now, a good abrader that I generally go for is a hard piece of sandstone. So I'm abrading down. Being quite aggressive, you can see some very tiny flakes coming off. Perhaps take a bit more off. There we go, I think that'll do. hammer stone, tilt it down, Get some very thin tiny flakes coming off, Got a nice flake there, little blade there, and I've got another quite concave bowl there so I'll come back to it and abrade the other direction. I appreciate I'm going over an awful lot and it does seem like a lot to remember, but with practice, and I know practice makes perfect, and I can tell you I've practiced a lot and I'm still not perfect, but it will start to make some sense as you go through it, I promise. I've really abraded that area quite aggressively now. In fact, this core is starting to turn into a blade core. Certainly with removals like that. See the ridges that are running down it. Hopefully, it'll behave this time. So it's followed the ridge. These blades are razor sharp and very fragile, so like many of the flakes I've just made, they can be used straight away. I think I'm running out of platform here. Find the small blade. So I'll go into one of the most basic flake tools and I'll pick up a smaller hammer stone. I'll make a scraper from one of those starting thicker flakes. Now a scraper is a unifacial tool, that means it's worked on one side. Something like a hand axe or a spear or a knife is a bifacial two-faced tool. If your scraper flake, it wants to be one that has some thickness to it, ideally with a little bit of curve to it, but you want to start with the purely flinty side, sometimes known as the ventral face, pointing upwards. So you can see the nice flinty side pointing upwards. The cortex side with the ridge, sometimes known as the dorsal face, like the back of a fish has the ridge with the dorsal fin. The dorsal side of a fin has the ridge, no fin though. A scraper is typically on the opposing end to the striking platform, so you can see it's over here, and I'm going to work around here. So this would be what's known as the distal distance end from the point of attachment. Like the large flint, I'll tilt it down, and I'll aim for about 
half a centimeter to three mil into the edge. Much lighter strikes. And instead of mostly forearm action, it's now mostly wrist, but I'm still turning the flint to meet the hammer stone rather than moving the hammer stone into the position I want to work. It's just much easier. And you can see that I'm getting proper flakes that are coming off. I'm not just crushing the edge and getting little broken pieces and crushed material to fall off. I am taking proper flakes off. And it might look as if I'm making contact with the edge, but I'm really not. I am striking one to two millimeters into the edge. So I'll end up with a much cleaner flake surface. A good scraper has quite a steep working edge but with none of these little spurs around the outside. So once I've got to the point I've got that steeped flaked angle, I'll just want to knock off the ends of those sharp spurs. A scraper would be for working fresh animal hide. So if it has any sharp points to it, when you come to working the animal hide, it can end up scoring or even cutting right through it. So I'll turn it over so you can see I've got this really nice continuous scraping curve to it. And a good test that I'm going to do, so you don't have to, is that if I can put it up against the palm of my hand and gently pull down, you could, should be able to see my skin gently being pulled back towards my wrist. And that's exactly what I want the scraper to do. I can't feel any sharp burrs cutting into my skin. And certainly if I was to cut through my skin to the bone, then of course it would still be too sharp and I'd have to take a couple of those burrs off. But this is about perfect. That's a finished stone tool, one of the most common stone tools out there. You'll find scrapers and assemblages from the start of the Paleolithic right through to the late Bronze Age and occasionally even later. So that's tool number one in our flake toolkit. The next tool I'm going to go for is a piercer. Now for a good piercer, it's sometimes best to start with a flake that has a bit of a point to it. This one's a bit fragile, but it should work. So the point of the piercer will follow this ridge here as that ridge will offer a bit of strength. So I'll have to remove the material from the sides here just to taper it a little more. I might even just use the abrader for this because it's so thin and actually just braid away at it to begin with. I might not be able to get the full way with just the abrader. Perhaps just finish it off with a small hammer stone. But that's certainly reduced it down an awful lot. I'll go back to the hammer stone. I may even actually use the abrader as an anvil stone. I'll just gently nibble at the edge. This is known as bipolar percussion. Previously, when I've been striking the edges with a hammer stone, I've been using direct percussion because I've been hitting it directly. This is quite a common flint napping method that was used in prehistory. And it's particularly good for when you're shaping a flake, but you're not so bothered about giving a sharp edge because I'm actually going to end up with a really blunt edge on the sides, but the point will be sharp. And that is the point of this tool. So I'm being really gentle. If you're making very fine awls, pointed tools, you may find you snap the tip a couple of times because it's just so fragile. I do it quite a lot. is unavoidable sometimes. There we go. Very sharp. Let's put a bit of cortex on the end, remove that. A really nice sharp awl that would be used for drilling into leather or wood, bone, antler, or any other soft material really, but very quick and easy to make. 
put that one to the side. And the next tool I'm going to go for is a saw. Now these are made in a slightly different way. I won't need my hammer stones for this. What I'll need is a blade. I've got quite a few. That's quite a good one. And instead of a hammer stone, as I said, I'll need another flake. There are two flakes that would make good saws. Put that one there. Ooh, another good flake. Yeah, I reckon that'll be good. So I've got two flakes this time. And I'm going to actually use one of these flakes to cut into the other flake. Because to make the teeth in this saw, I'm actually going to cut them out with the other sharp flake. I'm going to hold what will be my saw in exactly the same way and hold my flake as if I'm going to use it to cut. Just be aware of your fingers, make sure they're well out of the way. You can see the touch right back. And I'm going to place my cutting flake against the edge and just push down. You hear that sort of scratching noise. work my way along. I try to avoid going back on myself because you will just end up taking the ends of the teeth off and you'll end up with just a blunt edge. Do the other side and sometimes you can actually strike rather than cutting. A little bit of accuracy is required though. And you can see within seconds I've ended up with a tool that has teeth on both sides. Very useful, really common in Neolithic and Bronze Age assemblages for woodworking on quite thin bits of wood or tidying up uh, joints, not human joints, but woodworking joints. Another tool could be something like a burin, and for a burin these are a little more complicated and what you're essentially looking for is a flake that has a flat angle to it because all you're going to be doing is taking a little flake off the side. And there's one small one, not particularly good one. That's slightly better. So this is now a burin, and this tiny flake that's in my fingers here is known as a burin spool. These have actually been used for barbs on projectiles, but they are actually very good for drills or for bone and antler carving tools themselves. But the point I have here is a very hard angle here, but very, very good for scoring into bone and antler. And each time it needs to be refreshed, I'll just take another burin spool off. And it just refreshes with a single or a couple of decent strikes and you end up with an extra tool for each well-placed strike. These are really common in Mesolithic and Upper Paleolithic assemblages. And the, as you can see, some of these burin spools get really long. Every so often you might have to take a flake from the other side. There we go. And you can see how if you lined up several of these down an arrow shaft that they would make very good instant barbs very much like unretouched microliths. For a final tool that I'll go for is a Neolithic backed blade. Now these are very simple. I'll use that nice wide flake from earlier. I've got a nice continuous edge here. Now I did mention that some flakes can be used straight away as tools, and they certainly can, but if you feel the need to blunt one edge so you don't cut yourself, all you really need to do is a bit like a scraper, Work on one side. To the point where you've taken off that sharp edge. And there we go, won't cut myself. And there we go, just a very simple backed blade, very common in Neolithic assemblages. Simple. So each of the tools there have been made within a couple of minutes, sometimes even seconds. So they're all very simple and you can equip yourself with quite a decent toolkit with five flakes that each take a single shot, a 
and then another couple of minutes on each flake. It really doesn't take very long at all. Well, I hope you found that introduction to basic napping useful and making your own flake tools. They are some of the most common tools that you'll find in prehistoric assemblages and that are found in fields and uh, on excavations. I know I've talked about mode one technology earlier and you may still be thinking, well, what is mode one? There was quite an old system that tried to break down the development of stone tools because we have things like hand axes, blades, and where does all of that fit in? There hasn't really been an update on that system. Quite a few academics have worked on trying to improve that, but in theory you had a mode one system that was core and flake, which is what we've had today. We've had the flakes coming off that bigger piece of flint that was the core. Mode two, hand axes. Mode three is prepared core technology. Now that encompasses something called Lavalois technology. So it still has a core with flakes coming off, but the core has been prepared in a way that the flake or flakes that come off are of a relatively predetermined shape and size rather than just a series of flakes of different sizes and shapes that I've been producing today. The next mode four is blade technology that appears with us as modern humans. However, there are quite a lot of faults with mode technology is that it implies it's a continuous sequence of development. And that's really not the case because mode one technology appears throughout prehistory and hand axes go through use in the Acheulean, disappear, mode three comes in, but hand axes reappear. And we see Lavalois prepared core technology in the Neolithic as well. So it's not as straightforward as mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four. It in fact jumps about all over the place. So it really doesn't make it quite as straightforward as a continuous development in technology. It's quite a loaded way of describing it really. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. So if you come across the terms in literature in books, always take, well, certainly academic literature when it talks about quite practical methods with a pinch of salt. Next time, I'll be looking at antler hammers and how to use antlers to take off longer flakes and preparing edges in a way that's suitable for antler hammers. I've been talking about undercutting material and striking a few millimetres into the edge. Next time, we'll actually be striking onto the edge itself. We'll really be jumping forward in flint napping technology and method and I appreciate it'll be tempting to jump forward and you know you've made your flakes and your stone tools or flake tools and you want to go forward into making hand axes and thin stuff. Keep practicing and this video will be here as a bit of a teaser or the future one will be there as a bit of a teaser. I'm going to sign off for now. Remember to subscribe so that you get notifications of future nap times and all the other videos and exciting content. But I'm going to say goodbye and hope you enjoyed.